Okay, welcome back everyone. This is uh, SiliconANGLE and Wikibon's The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. Exclusive Amazon Web Services reInvent conference coverage live from, from the floor. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined by my co-host Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org. Our next guest is Brennan Seda, infrastructure engineer at Coursera, which is uh, taking the world by storm because online education done in a new way has been something that uh, we're, we're passionate about. Obviously, we, we do free content, Dave and I, and Dave and I are always talking about the failed project, or the project that never actually got off the, off the drawing board, Silicon Academy, uh, which was to, to be kind of like an, in, an educational video platform to help people. But I got to ask you, you know, the trend is your friend. Obviously, online education, Stanford has had huge success with their online course. I mean, and the, the amount of enrollment or people watching the computer science classes has really shown the way. And quite frankly, disrupting these institutional com uh, in educational facilities. I mean, they, they make money from tuition. They, they give it for free. We, we, we do give it away for free. We think there's a lot of value in what the universities still provide, and obviously we wouldn't exist without our university partners. But we, what we want to do is we want to help our university partners expand from simply teaching the, the students who they can attract and afford and, and the, who can, they can give financial aid for and really expand beyond so that they can teach people who don't have uh, the resources, the means, or the time to be able to come online. There's even other students, uh, one we featured on our blog, whose name is Daniel, he simply, just quite simply, he can't function in an online classroom. He has uh, autism and, and he just has trouble carrying on a, a conversation. He took a modern poetry class on Coursera and it's just been a phenomenal experience for him. We've been able to reach people in ways that we didn't even know we were going to reach and that's been a really fantastic part of the journey. You know, it's been, it's been fun to watch and it's still early days. Uh, you know, we're super excited. We're really behind what you're doing. Congratulations on that. But let's get, let's get into the geeky side of it because you know, when you have to roll this out, this demand, obviously partnering with uh, you know, those, those colleges and universities, you know, they have legacy stuff. But generally speaking, you got to put it out there as a service, right? So you guys are doing that. So walk us through some of the challenges that you guys did. Okay, there's a lot of demand for this. All of a sudden, the tsunami of online activity. How did you guys do architect your solution? What did you guys do with Amazon? What in the cloud uh, made, it, made, it, made it sing and how did you wire it together? Yeah, so we started uh, from typical humble beginnings as you know, a PHP website written by a bunch of grad students uh, and, and some, with some undergrad help. And, and we really started from there. We've been moving away and really changing around our underlying stack to, to make things a lot more powerful and a lot more user friendly. So for example, previously, or actually right now on Coursera, you, can, you can't, it's really hard to, for example, see a list of all your class upcoming assignments. And that's something we're working on changing. We're doing a lot of things underneath the hood. But really, starting from the beginning, we, we didn't have any, we didn't have any uh, very much funding when we were starting when, in, in fall of 2011. It was a little bit before my time, but Andrew, Professor Andrew Ng and, uh, and Daphne and some of the other Stanford faculty, they wanted to run this experiment. And we got started with Amazon and uh, we haven't looked back. Uh, it's been really phenomenal. Amazon has allowed us to scale our, our capacity in ways that we never thought would be possible. I actually just looked on our, our bill from last month and we're serving almost a petabyte of traffic through CloudFront every single month. So are you storing the videos up there? Or you host them on, is it all cloud? Any bare metal at all? Any on, any? The uh, only bare metal we have are our developer laptops. All, <laughs> everything <laughs> is, is in the cloud as it were uh, on S3, CloudFront, EC2. Dave, Dave and I always talk, well I always say, you know, DevOps guys are like, you know, they, they eat glass. I mean, they're like a unique breed. They're usually, and they're usually the young guys, right, like yourself. Uh, us old dudes like me, you know, we used to load patches, load software, you know, go <laughs> in and you know, put a disk drive in, you know, or you know, CD-ROM. But now the new model of coding is to push code, and the DevOps philosophy is a home run, fully integrated stack, updates across the, the code bases. So, so I want you to talk about how that influences you guys. How do you guys do development? Um, is, is it pure DevOps? Is there a lot of agile? Just take us through how you guys do the coding. That's a great question. So uh, the infrastructure team at Coursera up until a few months ago has really been comprised of only two full-time engineers. Yet we're managing uh, really massive scale, over five million students. Our, stu our students are, are more active than you would see in a lot of different, different uh, situations, different environments. So even though the number of students we have isn't necessarily as big as some of the other uh, big websites out there. There's a lot of, of load and a lot of students. 
And we simply, we quite frankly can't manage all the servers individually. So we very quickly moved to uh, having everything be an auto scaling group. Everything is installed and managed in, in very much a DevOps, even so much a, a no ops. We've moved beyond to some degree some of the tools like Puppet simply because they're hard to work with. They, there's an impedance mismatch between Puppet and, and an auto scaling where machines come and go all the time. And so we've actually, to some degree, even moved beyond that. As for our development and, and methodologies. Do you use auto scaling? You use, like, how do you handle the auto scaling? You use uh, Elastic Beanstalk, or what are you guys using? No, we use, uh, so we have our own uh, auto, so we auto scale based on, in EC2, based on CPU usage for our front ends and for our back ends. Uh, we've just been over provisioning to some degree, but auto scaling really gives us the flexibility to shoot a machine in the head and have it come back automatically without us having to do any intervention. And actually, just this morning, we got a bad instance. I was able to just terminate it right from the console, and everything immediately recovered as uh, traffic flowed to the new, newly created instance. Shooting it in the head versus what? Shooting it in the heart? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> just I mean, terminating it. Kill that, kill that machine, everything rolls over, all That's the right. software's there, everything. That's right. We don't have the time yeah. to deal with machines and individuals. Uh, we have to just treat them in, in bulk. So we, talk about some of the, the tools that you're using, or some of the services. Yeah, so we've taken a lot of inspiration from uh, Netflix, specifically their Asgard deployment model, uh, and we've actually implemented some of our own tools in-house. I've written some of our, uh, my own tools in-house to help us deploy code. So we started by, by uh, you know, manually going through and updating the code on all the instances, and we really want to have a much more rapid development process as we're trying to handle the rapidly increasing load. So I wrote a shell script that made things you know, pretty automated, but we've since moved to a web-based console, and since we've moved to that, we've gone from deploying every few days uh, at the beginning to we now deploy five, six, seven times a day, and it's been a huge boon for developer productivity. It's been a huge boon for liability. We now have um, the ability to do a fast rollback. So if, we, if we push bad code, we can quickly roll it back in about 10 seconds. Uh, it's made everything uh, work a whole lot smoother. I've written about it a little bit on my blog, betacs.pro. So, um Talk about a little bit more about what the services that you're using, maybe how you're protecting your, your data. Yeah, so uh, our primary data store is Amazon RDS. Uh, we obviously follow all the typical best security practices uh, to, to manage Amazon RDS. Uh, underneath, uh, we use actually a whole plethora of Amazon services, and that's simply because we don't necessarily care about how it gets done. We need to get it done quickly. We have so many demands on us. We have so many features we want to support. We don't have time to build our own queue service, so we use uh, either Apache Kafka or we use Amazon SQS. We use Amazon SES, SNS. We use S3, Amazon CloudFront. I can list off the whole uh, alphabet soup of everything we use. Uh, an intern, uh, Brian, he mentioned that uh, he misses talking about Amazon SQS in the security groups on, on EC2 with the, the auto scaling cloud formation, cloud front stuff. Anyway, it's pretty funny. Uh, we use a whole alphabet soup of, of Amazon services. So and can you how about, how about, just uh, one more question. How, so how do you protect stuff, back it up? Uh, talk, talk about that a little bit. That's right, so we use typical, so all of our data is either in uh, S3, which has uh, massive availability. Uh, we back stuff up to uh, uh, Glacier every once in a while, uh, something we should do more frequently. We have all our data in RDS, which has daily incremental backups, and finally we use, we have a little bit of data in some NoSQL stores that we also back up to S3. Um, something that we actually want to work on, and we're very glad that the uh, Amazon RDS team just released the cross-region uh, copy snapshots. We want to back stuff up outside of uh, the U.S. East region that we currently reside in. Why don't you use Glacier more? You, you haven't automated the the, the Glacier archiving? Yeah, we, if for us it's to use it, time. we have to automate it and we just need time to, to go through and make that so. Have you ever had to recover from Glacier? We have not had to recover from Glacier, uh, but luckily we've, we've turned on like Amazon S3 bucket versioning so that if a developer you know, accidentally deletes the wrong thing, we're able to quickly recover it. And uh, we've actually deprivileged all of our dev keys so that even if uh, uh, someone malicious were to take that stuff, they wouldn't be able to permanently get rid of our data, and we just trust in Amazon and their, their ridiculous number of nines of uh, durability for S3. So what are some of the things that you, you want Amazon to do, some of the things that you know, make your life easier? So cheaper is always a, a great thing. Well, it looks like they're working <laughs> on that. <right>? They are, <laughs> which, is, which is really great. Um, uh, to, to, to a large degree, I was actually talking with um, our, our account manager, Anne, as we were trying to set up our, our interviews. The Amazon and the Amazon infrastructure that we're using now has been quite reliable. We're really happy with it. Um, we actually were trying to figure out what feature requests and things we'd ask the individual teams as we met with them. 
Uh, the only things I could think of would, would be related to getting the web to move over to HDB 2.0 and, and, and uh, allow us to use and take advantage of the, the protocols so we can build um, more reactive and, and powerful web applications, more sophisticated without all the burdensome of uh, trying to manage different cloud front distributions and caching and all that sort of nonsense bundling. Um, and so it really just the, the biggest projects that we can have that we have that we would like to see are, are sort of blocked by not Amazon. Uh, Amazon's been great for us. What have you learned over the past uh, experiences with Amazon? Obviously, we use it as well. We have, you know, for our crowd chat application uh, and our crowd spots platform, we love it. I mean, so for us, I don't want to get into my own rhetoric, but I want to ask you about, I mean, what do you think of the service? I mean, can you imagine living without it? And just share to folks out there, what's it like programming on Amazon as a developer, but not an ops guy? What's it? What's uh, What's it like? So from a developer perspective, APIs make things so much easier. So I would not, even though I, I end up doing a lot of the operations and day to day, I don't really consider myself an operations guy. Being able to have, uh, being able to drive everything via APIs and automate everything has been a huge boon. That said, if you're a developer, you still have to realize that Amazon and, and large uh, uh, deployments and large infrastructure doesn't behave the same way a small colo does. So as for example, uh, to make things more concrete, uh, when we were initially deploying um, our new stack that runs on the JVM and using connection pools, our connection pools were quite simply unreliable. We had to do a fair amount of tuning, and that's just simply because the network is hostile. Instead, in, if you're in a typical small colo uh, or, or other, your own private data center, you have a few switches in between your app servers and your database servers. Within Amazon, you've got VPC, you've got cross regions, you've got or cross availability zones. You've got a whole bunch more nonsense in the way between your app servers and your database servers. You've got to tune accordingly and deal with things accordingly. Always know that things are gonna, yeah. just going to go away. And so break. I got to ask you, how well is it integrated into Git? Um, and how do you maintain multiple versions of applications? Um, you know, it's easy to scale up and down, but the auto configuring, you're making sure the right version, how do you guys handle that? I mean, do you override things and how do you, how do you, what, what do you do? How do you, what buttons do you push? That's a great question. So, uh, the way our deployment process goes is uh, developers work on their own branches. We have, every developer is able to run the entire uh, stack on their laptops locally, and you can develop locally in the different branches. Uh, when they're ready to test, we have a plus. We have a bunch of different environments, uh, staging environments, where developers can test out their code and within Amazon and can be QA'd and that sort of stuff. And this is all driven and automated by Jenkins. It's it's totally click button, uh, make it so type type tooling. And then finally, when they're ready, it gets merged into master, and then uh, developers then deploy their master out into into production, and, and it's a. Uh, that's the way it goes. So one of the things that we, we had, we basically built our own Redis cluster because Amazon didn't ship theirs yet. It's really not stable yet, so, <laughs> so but, but they're getting better. But now they shipped it, so it's ironic we had to build our own Redis prior to them launching it, Dave. I don't know if you know that, getting, getting in the weeds here. Um, but give an example of what you guys have done that Amazon hasn't done yet that you had to write for code. And is there anything that you've done and then they've come on right after? I mean, because they're pretty innovative. They're adding new services. You saw the chart. I don't know if you saw the chart in the keynote, but Andy Jassy's showing, you know, they're, they're deploying more and more goodness into the stack. Yeah, absolutely. What have you guys written that's been or your own code? Yeah, so we started, so uh, instructors upload videos, uh, their source videos as they try and um, provide content for our students to, to watch and learn from. And uh, this is before the Amazon Elastic Transcoder project existed. We built our own you know, encoding process. We're really happy to shut that down. We actually didn't go with Amazon Elastic Transcoder. We went with a different third party. But uh, yeah, there have been quite a few things that Amazon has built in that we'd be like, oh, if only we had that sooner, we wouldn't have to do a whole bunch of work. <laughs> That's like, they're, yeah, run and hurry up and catch up, right? So slow down. Yep. So, so they are innovating. What are they working on that you think is important that they need to have? That's, so, that's, that's on their to-do list. I mean, you know, it's not slim dunking them because they are moving fast. Yeah, I mean, one, way ahead of anyone, anyone else as far as we're concerned. The, the one that I had is uh, I'd like to be able to see what API calls have been made by what keys uh, through the Am to the Amazon services, and they just came out with uh, Amazon Cloud something or other to keep track of, uh, do security auditing of uh, what what API calls have been made and what changes have happened. Uh, I actually asked for this on a support ticket just a few weeks ago, and uh, they were like, sorry, we don't have anything available for you, and now I have my answer. Yeah, I was talking to Andy Jassy, and I said one of the things that they should do is integrate their uh, data warehouse uh, uh, product, um, um, Red, Redshift, uh, Redshift, into our log data. Because we get a lot of notifications from like Node, Node.js, so it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to get in there and, 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 and work with that. So that's something that they don't have, we, we'd like to see that. Um, but for the most part, you know, 
pushing out new code really trickles through the stack. It's really effective. Um, what are the what's the biggest home run that you guys sit back and saying, you know, this is a this is the, the killer thing for us. What is the what is that killer thing for your business online with Amazon that really makes everything work? Yeah, so being able to just rapidly deploy, scale up and scale down, but I really want to talk about deployment. Uh, I talked briefly about it earlier, just moving to this, uh, using the programmatic uh, APIs that Amazon makes available. We've built our own tooling on top of AWS, and that's just resulted in a, a huge boon in developer productivity. Coursera, we're heavily strapped on engineering talent, engineering manpower. If you're interested, come join us, come drop me a line. But uh, What's because your Twitter we're so, handle? Uh, uh, at bseta, uh, B-S-A-E-T-A, uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, and my email is just simply my last name at Coursera.org, S-A-E-T-A at Coursera.org. Great. The, uh, being able to control Amazon and, 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 and uh, rapidly deploy new code has been a huge boon for developer productivity, which is arguably the single most important priority for the infrastructure team, uh, and that is to enable all the other teams to work that much more rapidly uh, and, and develop that much more quickly. Uh, it's just been wonderful. Well, you got 48 followers on uh, Twitter. You just got 49 because I, I just followed you on Twitter. Excellent. Brendan, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Really great to see much. you. And again, not the, because I'm, I'm old compared to you young guns, uh, DevOps guys, eating glass, spitting out nails, as, as we say. <laughs> but the world's going there. So, you know, I think you guys are a great uh, example of what is the future. And certainly Amazon, seven years old, growing up real fast. So, uh, we love it. You love it. It's great stuff. But let's see if the enterprise is like it, Dave. So, uh, we'll be back with more coverage right after this short break. This is theCUBE live in Las Vegas on the ground floor here at Amazon reInvent Conference. We'll be right back.